Hey, happy new year, Lionheart Radio, and welcome to 2018. Hope the last year treated you right. It certainly did with us here at Lionheart Radio. We have some great guests lined up for 2018, as well as a lot more informational products and ways to interact with our audience. One of those ways is with a prolonged fasting challenge that we are putting on. We're going to begin on January 5th, and we're going to do a 72-hour fast with anybody and everybody who is willing to give it a try. By signing up, you also get our free ebook, a complete fasting guide that not only tells you information and the science behind a prolonged fast, but also gives you tips and tricks to help get through it. You also get exclusive access to an Instagram group where uh, you get to share some of your stories and some of the things that you're feeling as you go through your fast. As somebody that's done a prolonged fast, I can tell you that having that support group is invaluable and it definitely helps because I don't think I would have made it through had it not been for the Lionheart Media team behind me also trying to get through it. Today kicks off World Carnivore Month. For those of you that don't know what World Carnivore Month is, it's essentially a month where you eat nothing but meat, no vegetables, no fruit, no nothing. Many of you are probably thinking that's pretty counterintuitive, but before you cast any stones, I suggest that you maybe listen to this episode. One of the smartest human beings that I know is Ryan Muncy, and his ability to analyze and to look at problems is uh, unparalleled for anybody that I've met so far. He actually did the carnivore diet for a full month. He has lab results. We break down what he found, what he liked about it, what he didn't like, and some of his kind of unbiased findings as he's gone through the diet. So this is definitely unique. We haven't really talked to anybody who's ever tried this. I think it's a budding thing. But again, it's World Carnivore Month. You can check out the hashtag on Instagram led by Dr. Sean Baker. And uh, I hope that you guys enjoy this episode. And if you do, if you decide to try the carnivore diet, uh, let me know, Rick at Louisville.com. I want to know how it went for you. And without further ado, on to the show. All right, thanks for tuning in to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Louis Vive in San Diego, California, currently the author of Burn Your Couch, a manifesto for the average averse. And today I am joined by uh, Ryan Munsey, who is kind of becoming a semi-regular guest here on Lionheart Radio. Ryan, thanks for joining me. Man, if there was ever a show to be a semi-regular guest on, this is this would be a good one. So good. Uh, I'm I'm pumped to be here. And you know, you mentioned Lou Aviv. I actually screenshotted a post that you guys put up on Instagram. I need to share this um, in a few minutes. But it says raise your standards, lower your squats, speed up your heart rate, slow your breathing, give your best, but take your time. Yeah. That's money, man. I love that. I wrote that in my driveway today. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Well this done, morning man. before I left for work, well I was done. uh well done. One of the things that I learned from the breathing uh, power speed endurance seminar that I went to with Brian McKenzie is he tries to start every day with a breathing exercise because it's a habit that you can control regardless of your environment. And so that's something I do now. I sit in my car instead of like cranking the ignition right away and trying to take off. Even when it's cold, I just try to like center my breathing and I think. And then sometimes cool shit like that pops up. (laughs) Nice. I I had no idea. I just saw it. I loved it. I took a screenshot and – I'll we'll, we'll share it out in a little while. Yeah. All right, cool. So for people that are listening to this, I actually have an ulterior motive to have you on today, and that's to talk about the carnivore diet. Um, something that, I'll be honest, when you told me that you were going to do the carnivore diet, like my first, I guess, response was, why the fuck would you do that? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it sounds so counterintuitive. And I think what's even crazier about it is if you kind of take a step back and you look through the last year of health trends, it seems like plant-based is really becoming a trend, right? Like plant-based is, and a lot of that is stemmed from the blue zone research. So are you familiar with that? I am. I am. So for the guests or for the audience, um, blue zone research was essentially this, it it was a guy that wrote a book, right? (laughs) Yeah. So uh, there is a book. Blue Zones, Dan Buettner, um, but I think it was sort of a thing before he wrote the book, and I think he went and he examined all of these areas and, and was looking for, um, you know, the, the saying that comes to my mind is one that I love, and I'm sure you have heard it and employ it in your life as well, but success leaves footprints, mm-hmm. right? So instead of looking at what's different, you know, you're looking at, you take these five areas or these four areas and you say, well, what what is being done in all four or all five of these isolated areas? And you're like, well, there's probably something to those practices or those habits. Okay, exactly. That, that lead to longevity. So, so the reason that they're called blue zones is that per capita, they have the highest density of uh, people who live to be 100 or, or older. And one of the common threads between those people was the fact that they have a primarily uh, or predominantly plant-based diet. Uh I believe that 
um, some of the some of the commonalities were you know that they were active daily, mm-hmm. uh, that they moved a lot. So it wasn't necessarily that they had formal exercise or structured exercise, but maybe they lived in a place where they had to walk three miles to get, you know, their water or, you know, they had to row their canoe across a lake or something that they were doing something that was low intensity activity every single day. Um, you know, they ate seasonally and locally. Um, now I think one of the things that Sean Baker, who's sort of the, the head, thought leader in the carnivore diet world. Mm -hmm. I think he actually talked about this on the Joe Rogan podcast recently that every single one of those communities, while they did have a lot of plants in their diets, they all ate meat, especially red meat as well. Yeah. Um, And I think one of the things that gets overlooked in the conversation about plant-based diet or, or, you know, plants versus meat, you cannot have that conversation without talking about the quality of meat, where the meat comes from and how it's farmed. Um, you know, on, on so many different levels, the way it impacts the ecosystem, the environment, and the way that it impacts our health. Um, it, it's not the same conversation when you're talking about factory farmed versus grass fed beef. And I think that's one of the biggest problems I have with what Sean Baker was talking about on. Joe okay. Rogan so I was going to draw light to that because to him, it w- that was actually one of the things that made me step back and be like, Maybe this guy doesn't know as much as, or maybe we're just very disaligned in our values. Well, I think one of the things he said that I think is maybe accurate is that, you know, I think the way he phrased it and in his mind, you know, he's looking at, hey, I'm a, I'm a practicing physician. Uh, My wife is a practicing physician. So I know what she sees on a daily basis. Um, You know, my degree is in nutrition. I was trained on how to coach people on how to eat. I know what the average person eats. The people who listen to my podcast, the people who listen to your podcast, do not eat anywhere remotely near what the average person eats. And if you want to know what the average person eats, just go to Walmart and walk up and down the aisles and look in people's carts. Yeah, good point. It's appalling. It is. (laughs) And and I think to what Sean Baker was saying, it it hurts me. It really does. Like Mm -hmm. when I go to those places, I I just want to tell people. Like, I, I just want to grab them by the lapel and just be like, just jack them up against the wall. No, please. But I think to his point, he was saying that if you cut out all of those processed foods and you just ate meat, even if it's factory farmed meat, that you would be putting less poison in your body than if you ate the standard American diet. Which is true. Right. But let's also say that that doesn't even compare to if you just ate pasture raised wild meat, you know, that that is as far from the domesticated, you know, factory feedlot production model as possible. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I'm talking about, you know, wild caught salmon and, you know, um, you know, I, I was joking and I told you this, but I mean, I ate an entire deer last month. Um, (laughs) You know, I'm a bow hunter. I I harvested a, a deer, uh, in, uh, early October and you know I, that was what I ate so to me you know eating wild game and we can talk about this you know but humans have a, a really hard time digesting plants and in archaeological studies we've never found a society that was vegetarian even in these blue zones where we see cultures that mm, that's interesting Right. There's, there's, from an archaeological standpoint, there's never been a society that was purely vegetarian. So we know meat is a part of our history and our evolution, um, which is, is very important. And, you know, there's a lot of data and, and archaeological findings to support the fact that when we started eating more DHA, more bone marrow, that our brains continue to evolve. There are a lot of really intelligent people who are in this carnivore conversation and this is part of the reason that i wanted to try it Mm -hmm. so i I, and let me back up because because i I do not want people to think that i am a proponent of the carnivore diet okay um i am a person who i've got to experience stuff i i can't just take your word for something yeah that desire to know right right I, i you can tell me like that's the coldest water in the world as a matter of fact if you told me that was the coldest water in the world I'm going to get in it, not just put my foot in it, but I'm going to get naked and I'm going to put my whole body in it because I've done, I mean, you and I, we've done the ice bath thing and and, I mean, we like cold exposure. I want to know. 
Right. Like I've been in cold water. If you tell me that's the coldest, I want to know what that feels like. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, because knowledge is an understanding, right? You want to understand exactly, this thing. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, you know, I, I come from a, I've been trained in science. That's just how my brain works. And, and I want to know, you know, all the, the underpinnings of everything, the systems mm-hmm. and, you know, what it, what it's like. I, I really like what you just said, you know, knowledge is not understanding. And, so my first reaction, back up, my first reaction when I saw this carnivore diet thing was, was very much like yours. Why the hell would anybody do this? And, you know, it's crazy. It, it flies in the face of everything we think we know about nutrition. My degree is in nutrition. So, like, yeah. I kind of feel like, you know, if anybody should know, like, I mean, I, that's what I went to school for. I've taken all these classes and, you know, I, I've done all the science work. And then, you know, about a week or two went by and I couldn't stop thinking about it because it's so outlandish. Right. And right. So, so then it's like you get this curiosity and I start following these people on Twitter and I'm reading the conversations. And then there are people who are saying some really intelligent things and some, some really intriguing things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Georgia E is, is one of the people who's involved in the conversation. I'm not sure where she stands on the issue, but she's one of the names that really stands out in my mind as somebody who was providing some good insight and, and some solid science uh, there are a few other people as well. If you just go on Twitter and you use the hashtag carnivore diet, you're going to see um, a lot of posts. And, and I think if, if the people who listen to your show are smart enough to be able to figure out like who are the thought leaders and who are the followers. Right? Oh, don't give them too much credit. <laughs> but <laughs> no, you guys are smart. But I think some of the things that, you know, some of my initial questions were, you know, what about micronutrients? Um, what about the, the microbiome and our gut health? And, um, as far as the micronutrients go, so so this was my sort of my approach to this thing was I like these are my questions, these are my hangups, my concerns, mm-hmm. and I started seeing a couple of thoughtful um, arguments to sort of overcome those objections, and then I was like, all right, and I'll get into what those were, um, but once I saw those, I started thinking about it more and more, and I'm like, you know, there might be something to this. Every single person who has tried this. Mm-hmm except for maybe like one or two, Mm -hmm. let's call it 99% who have tried it said I was a skeptic in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing that separates carnivore diet in my mind from keto or or paleo. When we talk carnivore, I don't know that we, we define it. We're talking all meat and water. (laughs) Right. Right. Only zero, zero plant matter. Right. Um, 100% animal products. That's right. And, um, and I did this, uh, for 33, 34 days, the mm-hmm. entire month of November, I started two days early and I went through, uh, like the first weekend in December, um, and, um, documented everything. I got lab data, uh, did blood tests, did a microbiome test. Uh, we'll talk about some of that stuff. I don't have all the results back yet. Um, but I think the thing that, that was most compelling to me was that the people talking about it. And talking about their positive experience, we're not evangelists. We're in the keto world or the paleo world. People can come across as an evangelist. You're right. This is the best way. This is the only way. If you don't do this, you're wrong. Right. Everybody that I saw. It's like, I don't know, man. It's working. We're like, yeah. They they were skeptics. They were like, I tried it because I thought it was crazy. Right. And now I feel better than I've ever felt. Mm -hmm. Um, For me personally, I lost body fat. I got stronger. Mm Mm-hmm. My energy levels were stable to begin with, but they stayed more stable. I have a reduced uh, need for caffeine. Uh, I'm a coffee lover, so I will always drink coffee, but I don't need it anymore. I don't wake up mm. um, and like have a stopwatch going, like, when am I going to get my coffee? Right. That's um, an interesting side effect. Yeah. So, so significantly less caffeine. Um, I think that's just from stepping off the roller coaster, right? Of the carbohydrate glycogen spike. Well, but I was doing pretty much keto before. Okay. So, you know, there wasn't really much glycogen. Um, and and we can talk about what I was doing before and and, and sort of how everything changed. Um, you know, basically I was doing keto before. So my protein intake went up. Um, you know, I, I did some of the math. I specifically did not track macros. I didn't weigh food. I didn't want to be caught up in that stuff, okay. but I can tell you that my protein intake went from about 20% of my total calories to somewhere between 35 and 40%. Um, so it was a significant boost in protein intake. Um, I felt so much stronger. I felt, uh, I had that bounce back in my step. I felt power. Like mm. I didn't feel on keto. Um, and I got stronger in the gym. I, I'm, uh, I'm hitting doubles and triples now. 
with weights that are heavier than I was hitting for singles a month and a half ago. I think that's what you said that made me realize maybe it's something I wanted to try because although my results with keto were great, I lost a lot of strength. Yeah, and I'm lighter. Yeah. I, I lost uh, – the first week I lost five pounds. Uh, I went from 188 to 183, and within that – like by week three, I was up to about 185, 186, and I stayed in that range no matter how much I ate every single day. Okay. I mean there were some days where – uh, so the way I set this up was I ate two meals a day. I've always done intermittent fasting, and I continue to do that. So I would eat my first meal sometime between 11, 10 and 11 in the morning. Um, if it was a lift day, I would go train. I was lifting five days a week. And then uh, I'd have my second meal yeah, sometime between 3 and 5. Um, I didn't get hung up on when or mm. you know, whatever. Okay. But essentially it was one to one and a half pounds of meat in the morning, and then one to two pounds in the afternoon and if it was a big lift day and I was hungry I'd eat two pounds of meat or I'd eat you know a pound of meat and then a bunch of bacon and then you know whatever else I wanted and, right um you know there, there was no limit on what I wanted and I think that's the other thing I was going to say um a minute ago was that it, it changes your relationship with food it really shows you the difference between physiological hunger mm -hmm. and psychological hunger. Mm. You, you learn the difference between eating because you want something and eating because you're hungry. Yeah. Because there were times where it's like, you know, I, I was craving dark chocolate or avocados or, you know, I, I think like the first day that I went grocery shopping on this diet, <clears throat> I go into Whole Foods and they have this giant vat of like handmade fresh guacamole. Like the chick is standing there with like a potato masher just churning handmade guacamole right and i'm like you gotta be kidding me right like um, <laughs> two weeks ago i would have just put both hands in yeah. and like <laughs> right. you know bobbing for apples <laughs> right but you know so if you're going to eat on the carnivore diet like you've got to be hungry to eat a steak or open a can of tuna and eat a can of salmon and a can of tuna uh, so you really learn the difference between hunger and um you know craving yeah yeah that's that's one of the things i've noticed like one of the side effects of Western culture is that, uh, food is like when we eat is manufactured by our surroundings. Right. Absolutely. And like you said, like intermittent fasting is something you've always done, but I'm assuming that it's something you've scheduled into your life. Whereas it almost seems like it's a natural byproduct of this diet. Um, for the few days that I've been on it and I've been doing it for only three days now. Um, but it's like you said, you, you eat when you're hungry. Right. And so I'll naturally not eat until like 10, 11 o'clock Really because I think, yeah, I think it just takes more, I don't know it, it, whether it's more effort or what it is, but you just, you're not going to just eat a steak because you're bored. Right. Right. And that's what we tend to fall into. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the, again, let's go back to the average American. Mm -hmm. uh, think about their average morning routine is, you know, wake up, they didn't get enough sleep. They have a crazy hectic morning. They mm -hmm. got to get to work. They're commuting and they're going to either run through Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or wherever and they're going to get a coffee and something that they can hold in their hand and chow down on while they're uh, commuting to work. Yeah. Whether that's in the car or on a train or whatever. And that's usually going to be something that's heavy carb. And if you're lucky, there's egg or sausage or something on there. And, right. Um, you know, like you said, you're not going to see somebody with a, you know, a grilled ribeye in their hand, you know, Fred <laughs> Flintstone style right. taking right. bites out of it. Um so it, it is it is interesting to see sort of how that changes your relationship with food. Um, yeah. So one of the arguments that I probably brought to you right out of the gate, which was, what about your micronutrients, right? Uh, and Sean Baker um, on the Joe Rogan podcast, if you haven't listened to that, go listen to that. Because like you said, he's kind of the uh, thought leader in the carnivore diet um, hemisphere right now, right? Stratosphere, whatever it is. And uh, I don't think he did a great job of answering the micronutrient question on that show. Um, but your answer was actually pretty good, which is like, well, the, the people, the body of people that have typically put out all of our recommended daily, um, allowances for food have kind of been fucked up on every other issue going right. forward. Yeah. And I, I do remember having that conversation with you and I mean, when have they ever been right? Right. I mean, think about this. I mean, you're all the food pyramid in your head. Yeah, right now. You're, you're, my, you're the same age as I am. Like most of our listeners are our age. Like go back to when you were a kid, you remember that food pyramid that had like those 
like squares. Right. And when we were young, the bottom square was like six to 11 servings of cereals and whole grains a day. Like, it's so crazy. Who's going to fucking now? do that now? Right. right? Like right. we know that's wrong. Well, they also told us then that whole eggs were bad for us, that mm-hmm. butter was bad for us, that saturated fat and cholesterol were going to kill you. And we know that the sugar industry paid for that. Yep. Um, so, you know, what, what gives us uh, confidence that their RDI, the recommended daily intake for certain micronutrients, is accurate? I mean, we know it was wrong for vitamin D. You know, they say we need to be around 25, uh, I forget the, 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 the numbers, nanograms per deciliter or whatever it is, but, yeah. but we know that that's just bare minimum for right. functioning. I mean, you need to be closer to like 45 to 65 to really have optimal health the way we want to. So, you know, they were wrong on that one. Uh, I did like the way that uh, Sean Baker talked about um, the role that carbohydrates play in um, uh, the RDI, like the the recommended daily intake that we need for certain micronutrients. I think he listed vitamin C and manganese as Mm -hmm. examples. So if you didn't hear that one, um, vitamin C and glucose actually compete for uptake. So if you eat the standard American diet and you have a high glucose intake, then you need a lot of vitamin C to make sure that you get vitamin C where you need it to be. Right. If you don't eat any carbohydrates, I mean, basically the, the carnivore diet is a zero carb diet. Then you have a greatly diminished requirement for vitamin C because it's not competing with anything. So you have a much greater uptake of what does come in. Yeah. Um, and that's a revelation in itself. Right. Most people are not aware of that. Like maybe the reasons that we need things like vitamin C and fiber are being right. induced by this garbage that we're eating. Right. And then, you know, uh, the other thing was manganese, which is uh, involved in carbohydrate metabolism. Again, if you're not eating carbohydrates, you don't need a cofactor to help break it down and assimilate energy from that. Mm. Um, vitamin B, most of the B vitamins are involved in carbohydrate metabolism, pulling energy from those. Um, so it, it is really interesting. And we don't know. This is the thing. We don't know what those RDI should be for someone not eating the standard American diet. So mm-hmm. even if we had blood work that tells us what those levels are, how do we know if they're good or bad? We don't have a reference range right. for someone not eating the standard American diet. It's like what we're basing optimal off might be fucked up in itself. Well, it is. I mean, I mean, what we're basing these RDI off of is – sick, average, unhealthy, mediocre people following the standard American diet many, many years ago. Yeah. And, you know, first of all, we don't want to be that anyway. Mm -hmm. So then if we take somebody that's not eating that way, we 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 just, so we don't know. And I think, again, this is one of the things that fascinates me about the carnivore diet is that there's just so many things we don't know and, and so many things to call into question. So then, you know, that was micronutrients. One of my other concerns was the microbiome, and that was one of the questions that, you know, you had when, when we first started talking about it as well. And, and I mentioned Georgia Ede and, and some of the other thought leaders. You know, there are some people presenting arguments that when we separated from other apes, you know, we traded a smaller gut for the ability to be bipedal, to stand up Mm -hmm. on two feet, um, and to have a larger brain. So we spend a lot less energy in digestion than chimpanzees or gorillas. So some people in the nutrition world are arguing that larger brain, smaller gut means we should be eating fewer plants compared to... Because of the energy it takes your gut to process? Not necessarily the energy, but just like the actual hardware, like the structure. Mm. Like we don't have a large gut um, for which you know we are designed to process all of that stuff. I mean, cows eat grass; they have four stomachs, right? right? So, I mean, they're supposed to eat grass, right? Uh, you know, they they ruminate on that stuff, and you know, they regurgitate cuds, and you know, we don't do that, right? Uh, so, and again, you know, humans do not assimilate energy and micronutrients from plants as well as animals. And in the book, Go Wild by John Rattay, he, he mentions this. And, and John Rattay is a Harvard um, psychiatrist, and, and he's written um, – Spark was a great book, and, and Go, Go Wild is another book that he wrote. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, definitely pick that up. But I read that a, a while ago, and, and as I was thinking about some of this carnivore diet stuff, I, I re- recalled hearing him say something about that. And 
you know, it, it is in that book where, you know, there and in Sapiens, they both talk about there are no vegetarian societies that we found in mm. archaeological records. Um, and then John Rattay talks about humans have a poor ability to assimilate these nutrients. So the way that we got around that was we outsourced, we delegated that job to the animals that we consume. So again, going back to the quality of the meat that you eat, if you think about the factory farm cow who eats the same glyphosate infested corn and soy pellet right. all day, every day, they're going to get very little micronutrients. On the other hand, if you have a true pasture roaming or wild game or, or wild caught fish that is out there eating, uh, you know, think about a, a an elk or a moose or, or something that's out there it's eating, you know, all kinds of acorns and herbs and grasses and persimmons and, you know, whatever else, you're going to get a wide variety, wide range of micronutrients. Um, yeah. You know, so it stands to reason that you may get all of the micronutrients that you need, especially, and here's the other kicker that, you know, I don't think Sean Baker talked about. And, and one of the modifications that I made to my version of the carnivore diet was that I put a huge emphasis on eating organ meats because we know they have a, a tremendous micronutrient content, liver, heart, um, kidney. Um, you know, so, so that was sort of one of the ways that I kind of protected against not getting mm. micronutrients. Um, there, there's more micronutrients in liver than in almost any vegetable. Dude, I put a liver in my mouth yesterday. <laughs> I couldn't do it, dude. I was like, give it to the dog. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Here's how I eat liver. Um, one way is actually it's pretty hardcore. You got uh, to freeze it and take a really sharp knife and chop it up into tiny little pieces while it's frozen. And you basically have these like frozen pellets. You just pull them out of the freezer and just eat a frozen pellet. Mm -hmm. um, if it's frozen, you don't get that like stringiness. Um that, like I said, that's kind of hardcore. Um, the single best way that I've found to get liver is U.S. Wellness Meats. They have liver worst. And I love the way that tastes. It's made with um, liver, heart, and kidney from grass-fed beef. Mm. Um, so when I did the carnivore diet, I ate at least one of those uh, per week. Okay. So yeah. that's, an e that's, that's probably the easiest and least painful way. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So... I, I like the idea of taking an evolutionary biology perspective and all of the different kind of mindsets and perspectives I've seen so far. That's the one I can rationalize to make the most sense. Right. 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 Um, unless you think we were only here for 2000 years, in which case, like maybe it is plants, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, so that, if, if that's what you think, then maybe just pray on it and see what happens. Yeah. Right. See maybe what, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, religious crowd tends to be more carnivores where, um, seems like, you know, yeah. it, cause they seem to entertain the idea of hunting and things like that more, um, where more of like the hippie crowd tends to be more of like the flat tooth. Right. <laughs> right. 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 One of the, one of the things that I've added to this diet for myself, and I don't know whether it will be sustainable or not, but I, I like it cause from an evolutionary biology perspective, it makes sense to me. I have been running to the grocery store every time I'm hungry to buy meat. I like it. In, a, in an attempt to recreate that, uh, yeah. the way that it was, right? Yeah. Like, cause you know, I think I wrote a post on this a while ago, but I like the idea of having this called Lionheart Radio, but we tend to think of lions as this king of the jungle that gets whatever the fuck he wants, whatever he wants. And that's actually not, not true at all. Right. And that's like, if you go back to early man, that's how we were. We had to survive for long periods of time without getting the kill. He gets it because he knows if he doesn't, then he won't survive. Right. That's what being lionhearted really means. Right. right. Exactly. Like we were, we were joking about this. Uh, was it Saturday when we were talking that I had just seen a post from Tim Kennedy and right. he said, you know, I train so that I can fight like the third monkey on the ramp onto the arc and it's starting to rain. Yeah. Like, right. like his, his survival depends on it. And, and for a lion or for anybody in the wild, for our ancestors, that's how it was. Yeah. And and we are so far removed from that, especially in the U.S. And for people who have smartphones and listen to podcasts, I mm -hmm. mean, that's, you know, not the reality of our lives today. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, 
and, and, and I think long term, I don't think that I will stay carnivore because with that exact thought process in mind, I don't think humans have ever been a mono food society. We had to I, gather. I, right. We, 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 we are opportunistic feeders. Right. It just so happens that, you know, we figured out how to hunt animals and yeah. that was the greatest return for our investment because, you know, it, it was a lot easier to kill a woolly mammoth and have food for months or for a week for the entire tribe, as opposed to, you know, everybody living off of mushrooms and berries and twigs. Right. 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 And, and the interesting thing is though, when we, it seems to me, the more that we get back to what it seems like we evolved from there, there seems to be some part of that re that resonates with us, right? We seem to be healthier, mm -hmm. uh, happier and more productive when we kind of get back to our roots in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so was that your finding, I guess, over the last 30 days of doing the carnivore diet? Did you find yourself in a different mindset, so to speak? Did you find yourself more positive, more, I mean, what, what was your kind of subjective findings? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think, so going from keto to the way that I did carnivore, my protein intake jumped significantly, like I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. Um, and my strength went up. I felt, like I said, I felt energized. I felt I had that. The only way I can describe it is that bounce. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever seen, like, I'm sure you've been around guys who train for um, fighting or, or whatever. And like, if you've seen somebody, uh, I call it that kind of danger, the bounce of a dangerous man. Mm. You know, like they know what they're doing. Yeah, like right? kind of confident. Yeah, that, that, that sort of bounce and kind of the way, uh, that's the only way I know how to describe it. Or like the bounce of an athlete. Like if anybody's been on a track and you just, you see somebody that can perform. Like, yeah. It's like you're always closer to flow in a way. Yeah. Um, and, and I just felt, I mean, I think it'd, it'd be cliche to say I, I felt primal as fuck, mm -hmm. you know, but I mean, yeah. I, well, you're crushing steak. I mean, that's all you're eating. You know? <laughs> and, and it's just like, uh, I think as, as the month wore on, like I'm getting stronger, I'm feeling better. Um, I, I don't know what my testosterone was before. Uh, I did not get blood work like the week before. I wish I had. If I could do this over, I would have gotten blood work immediately before. So I can't say whether or not my testosterone went up. Um, but I mean, I, I, and I told you this subjectively, um, you know, I don't know if I want to say this on the air or not, but I mean, there was lead in my pencil in the morning. You know? Right. Let's just <laughs> say it that way. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's. Felt more testosterone. Yeah. Yeah. And I've I, noticed it as well. Right. In only three days. Really? Yeah. Um, so maybe yeah. I was looking for it cause you mentioned it, but right. it does feel like a, a side effect. But I mean, and, and this is something that Sean Baker talked about on the Joe Rogan podcast, you know, that societies have known for a long time that the more meat we eat, the better we perform. You know, Roman gladiators did that. Roman soldiers did that. Um, I think he mentioned, um, or maybe it was in Sapiens or, or one of the other books that I've been reading recently, uh, it all kind of blurs together, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the Cheyenne, tribe was one of the tallest tribes, um, tallest groups of people. And, you know, they basically subsisted off of Buffalo, um, you know, American bison on the, the plains. Right. So, you know, there, there is historical record of an, a direct relationship between the amount of meat consumed and, you know, height or performance. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not really like as scientific as we would like those studies to be today. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there, there is something to it. Um, what I will do going forward is I will keep my protein at this level. Mm. I will not drop my protein back down um, because I, I don't know that it is I, – I, I can't say for sure without more experimentation, is it the increased protein or is it the absence of plants? Um, I have experimented a little bit with adding some plants back and – seen a little bit of inflammation come back. Um, maybe that's part of the adaptation period. I mean, obviously if you don't eat them for 30 days and then you add them back, um, you know, your body is not going to be used to them. Right. But, it's not necessarily that there's an intolerance. It's that you haven't processed. Them. Right. So, so I don't know. I mean, it's going to take a little bit of, um, some, some playing around, some tweaking, some trial and error to see. But, you know, like I said, I, I do not envision staying, 100% carnivore going forward because mm -hmm. I just don't think that's how humans 
what yeah, have been. Yeah. Um, so now the question then will become, you know, what plants will I eat and, and how much? Um, what I will probably do is try to get some leaner cuts of meat and um, replace that fat with either carbohydrates or fat from plants like an avocado sure. or, or nuts or something like that. Um, but then what I'll also do is I select my plants is I'll kind of cross reference them with Gundry's plant paradox to make sure that I'm not eating plants that uh, have a negative impact on humans because, you know, and that's a whole other story. I mean, plants don't want to be eaten. And I think that's a conversation that a lot of plant based eaters are overlooking. Plants do not have the ability to run from their predators. Mm -hmm. They're stuck where they are. Okay. So their defense mechanism is lectins or gluten or anti-nutrients, all these things that uh, prevent them from being eaten by other animals in the wild. And, and that's uh, something that is explored in Gundry's book, The Plant Paradox. And, mm -hmm. and he is much more eloquent than I am at this. And um, I have not actually read that book. I've only uh, skimmed it so far. So uh, that's the gist of it. Right. Um, so I would definitely say if somebody wants to look more into that, check out his book. Yeah, that, that is an interesting concept and, and would be maybe hard to prove, but but the theory seems to hold water. It, yeah, I, I mean, he may have some, some evidence and some proof in there. I, I've looked at, what I have looked at are his lists of, you know, foods that we should eat, foods that we shouldn't eat. And, you know, I mean, even in the paleo world, you know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, you shouldn't eat certain foods mm -hmm. because of these anti-nutrients, like right. gluten, you know, certain grains, things like that. Right. So, yeah. Right. And, and plants are generally much more intuitive than we give them credit for because we don't give them any credit as this inanimate object as having any kind of sense. Oh, I mean, they're plants. Plants are sentient. I mean, look at sunflowers. They, they can turn with the sun. They follow the sun throughout the day. Um, I mean, th there are tons of examples in biology of, of plants having, um, you know, the ability to uh, demonstrate sentience. Right. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, is that, you know. That's a jump to sentient. It is. Uh, I, I've interviewed. Um, it's couple, interesting. I've interviewed a couple of people. There, there's a guy who's actually a vegetarian who wrote a book. Um, I, I'll have to look it up and I'll, I'll send it to you. I forget the guy's name. He was on our podcast. It's been probably a year and a half. Um but he actually, he wrote this blog post that went viral. It was like, why it's actually impossible to be a vegetarian. And he talks about how, like, let's say an animal dies and decomposes and then a plant uses uh, the nutrients that that thing puts into the soil, mm -hmm. right? So that plant is consuming nutrients from the soil that may have once been an animal. For sure. So now if you eat that plant or the root from that plant that used that stuff, are you really a vegetarian right yeah that that's a hard argument to and, and, then, and that was written There's by a that. vegetarian right right so i mean you know so let me ask you about this so so we talk about plants like kind of not wanting to be eaten so animals also do not want to be eaten and one of the really good arguments i've heard for not eating animals and something i don't know that i've looked into to the extent that i can talk about knowledgeably but is the idea that when you kill an animal, these fear hormones are released, right? These, mm -hmm. these, this thing is scared to die, right? Right. And when you eat it, there's, there's some argument that says that you are actually injecting because those hormones are so mm -hmm. prevalent right at the end of its life mm -hmm. that you are actually ingesting some of these fear hormones that, that might be able to be passed on to you. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think right off the bat, it, to me, that sounds sort of like either the, the laws, regulations around like halal and kosher. Right. I mean, that's like for something to be uh, ordained as kosher, uh, it has to be killed in a manner that the animal doesn't have that fear response. I believe I'm, I'm not perfectly familiar with those regulations. I'm sure somebody listening knows that better than I do. But I think that that is the point of like, that's how you get a kosher, you know, label on mm, okay. something like that. Um, so so there's definitely uh, legitimacy to that. Um and I think that's why a lot of uh, animals that are harvested are likely harvested in a humane way. Um, I grew up hunting and fishing, so I have tremendous respect for uh, our wildlife and our natural resources. And, and I think most people who hunt are that way. Um, I agree. At least most of the people that I know. Yeah. Um, people who they're who, shitheads, but. People who, yeah, I mean, there's there's always bad apples, but right. the people who really appreciate it, uh, appreciate our land and, and what we have and, and what our animals um, are. And I can just tell you that um, 
harvesting an animal and, and eating an animal that you have harvested yourself will change your relationship with food. 100%. Um, you know, I, I have, um, you know, I don't need to get graphic, but I mean, you know, I, I'm a bow hunter. So, um, you know, to be that close to an animal and, and harvest it with a bow and arrow, and then, you know, you're going to field dress it. You got to remove all the organs and the guts, you skin it, you, you, you know, butcher it. I mean, when you, when you go through that process and then you have this meat on your plate and you're like, man, you know, this animal gave its life to provide me nourishment. Yeah. I don't think about it as, you know, the, the potential fear hormones that would have gone through it. I mean, as a hunter, you're always looking for a clean and ethical kill. You never, uh, the, the worst thing, the worst feeling that any hunter could experience would be to, you know, shoot an animal in the hind quarters and, yeah. you know, injure it right. and, and have it die a horrible death. Like that's no hunter wants that to happen. Right. Uh, let's just say that right now. Um, has it happened before? Sure. I mean, things happen, but, um, you know, you're looking for a clean kill, you know, right through the heart. And a lot of times those animals don't have a clue. I mean, yeah. that's, especially if you're bow hunting and you're going to be within 30 yards, like, trust me, deer don't walk up to you and say, Hey, here I am. Shoot me. Right. right. Like, right. They don't know what's coming. Yeah. You get, you get an appreciation for it. Like you said, and you also get an understanding of like where you really shake out the food chain. Right. Yeah. And that's another thing that, that I've actually thought about in the last few years with a lot of people, you know, um, I don't post a lot on social media about hunting, but occasionally there have been people who, you know, have said certain things. Um, and one of the thoughts that I've had about this, and I'm not sure where I, I really come down finally, you know, on this, but the thought is if you're not willing to harvest an animal, if you're not willing to participate in the harvest of the animal that is going to provide you nourishment, should you eat meat? Yeah, I've thought about that myself. I don't know. So you're you're a cerebral guy, right? You look at things um, from an intellectual standpoint, from what um, just getting to know you. What have your objective findings been? Yeah, so um, this was interesting. Uh, I'll try to pull this up but uh, and give you the exact numbers. But um, I did blood work, um, and I did a stool test. I... I just think I get a, I'm, I call me cerebral and I'm going to tell you I shit the shit. box and mail <laughs> right. it to somebody. Right. But I mean, right. I just think that's hilarious. Like, right. You know, as, uh, um, that to me, that's just kind of crazy. But uh, so I did that and actually just got the results back today. And I have a phone call uh, for a consultation scheduled actually tomorrow okay. uh, with the lab to sort of go over those results. Um, I can tell you kind of the raw numbers on that. But as far as blood work goes, um, again, with the micronutrients, nothing was abnormal, but again, we don't know, right? Uh, we don't know what I need or what we need for this type of diet. And just because they are normal for standard American diet doesn't mean that I'm not deficient for this diet. Yeah. And that's um, something I, I keep going back to, which is like assigning normal to biology is almost impossible anyway. Yeah. And, and here's the other thing before we talk about some of these, this is another question that I've actually kind of come up with over the last few days as I've been reflecting on all this stuff. Um, you know, we talk about microbiome and gut health, and this has been a huge, huge conversation piece in the last like five years in, in all spheres of, you know, CrossFit, paleo, keto, whatever. Sure. That word was first coined in 2001. The first time it showed up in like Wait, in word? scientific literature, microbiome, it showed up in a paper in 2001. Mm. Um, there have been some studies on fecal and oral bacteria, like from the 1680s, um, and and of course people have studied you know those things for a while, but but the word microbiome first kind of came up in. 2001, 2007 was where it really saw an uptick. So let's just say 2000, right? Okay. So we're 17 years into the study of this thing. But really, we're but really it's, right. Really like knowing what it is, knowing how much bacteria is in uh, our gut. Um, what other area of the human body can we say that we understand a 100 percent? And with full accuracy at all, much less in the first 20 years of studying it. 
Yeah. Well, if you look at the last couple of years, the role that that microbiome plays, though, is becoming more and more complex. And, and right. And, but because we continue to find out more and more about it. We're understanding it to be more. Complex, right. So today. to say today, for anyone to say today with certainty that they know all of its roles, all of its interactions, implications, uh, what that biome should look like. I think that's a little bit hasty. Sure. Um, so we don't know. And I think I think it's it's important to say, you know, we don't know. Um, and that's a fascinating thing about really the idea of the carnivore diet at all is, it, is it's really like taking everything we think we know and it's like flipping it on its head. And then you start to ask the deep questions and you start to realize like, oh, shit, maybe I actually don't know. Right. Which right. Is, that's the fascinating part. And, and that's that's what I said in the very first line of the, the blog post that I had when I said I'm doing this. It's like, you know, if you're not comfortable cha- challenging your paradigms. Quit reading. Just don't read this right. Yeah. We'll, and we'll link that up in the show notes. So people check um, that out. Because you're not going to like what I have to say. Right. Um, so hemoglobin was actually low, um, 12.8. And for people that don't know, the reference range was 13.0 to 17.7. Um, and that's interesting. I mean, you're basically talking, uh, if it was really low, we'd be talking anemia. Right. Which is like, how the fuck am I anemic? All I did was eat red meat. Now, leafy greens is what people would point to. Well, I'm 12.8, um, reference range 13.0. So it's not like I'm too far from being in that reference range. Yeah. But I mean, if I'm, if, if I can't satisfy, you know, those needs, uh, just through meat, it'd be interesting. Sure. Um, and then let's see, blood urea nitrogen was, uh, slightly higher than the normal range. Um, not crazy. But again, I'm eating two to three pounds of meat a day, so I'm going to have positive nitrogen balance. There's going to be a little bit more nitrogen in my blood. Yep. Um, Which had, can have cancer-causing qualities, right? Uh, I don't know about that. Um, if somebody else knows, I'd be yeah, interested too. to hear that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and then the, the only other thing that, that stood out on this one was uh, my lipid panel. So total cholesterol was 241. Um, of course, anybody that knows cholesterol, anything over 199, they're going to tell you that's high. Um, but interestingly, there is a total cholesterol to HDL ratio. And this was fascinating to me. So for this ratio, if it is 3.4, then you are at half of the average risk for diseases associated with cholesterol. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're at a 5.0, you're at average risk. If your ratio is 9.6, then, um, you're at double the average risk. Now those, those are for men, uh, for women, it was like 3.3, 4.4, 7.1. Um, my ratio was 3.6. So even though my raw number for cholesterol was high, my ratio is basically saying I'm at half the risk of the average person. Um, cholesterol is one of those things. I'm not worried about it being high because it's involved in so many different things. It's, it's involved in the, the structure of all of our cell membranes. It's the backbone for vitamin D for testosterone. Um, as long as my ratio is, is where, you know, I'm at half the risk. Um, I'm not terribly concerned about that. Like I'm not going to see that number and say, Oh shit, I need to start eating plants again. Okay. Um, so, so really, th- those are the only things on the blood panel. Um, and then with the microbiome, um, what I can tell you from looking at it, uh, again, I have a consultation tomorrow, um, but on my, um, just, just looking through it, I had zero bad bacteria in my stool. Um, mm. So the way the test is broken down, it looks at um, how much good bacteria, how much uh, like what they call it's, it's in the yellow. So it's, it's basically broken into green, yellow, and red. And the yellow is, um, neither good nor bad. And I had a few uh, of those strains. I had zero of the bad strains. And then of the good strains, like three out of the five, I had a, uh, plus four, which is, which means I had like as much as you could possibly possibly have. Yeah. And then there were two that actually showed no growth. Um, you know, that, According to gut health experts, we want, but again, like I'm saying, 
I don't know how much I, you know, believe that because sure, we've got a few studies that say, you know, some of these are good, but I don't know. Right. We, we, I mean, and those, those results are encouraging. Anyways. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, and so let me ask you this after kind of like diving into the research, diving into the experience, and then also kind of testing that experience against what you already know, do you, is this something that you would recommend for people to try? I would say I general population. Yeah, I would say I have not seen any results in my blood work or my subjective experience that would lead me to believe an experiment with this would be detrimental to one's health. Mm. Is that the safest way to phrase it? For sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so from from a nutritionist standpoint, you have that, a good career as a lobbyist or politician. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's my official answer. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, if I'm just talking to a friend, you know, then I'd say, yeah, I, I think try it. Yeah, I mean, right. it, and that goes for anything. I mean, we hear about keto, we hear about paleo, we hear about carnivore. I mean, how will you ever know anything unless you try it or experiment with it? Um, yeah, I, I, I really, I haven't seen anything yet that says doing this for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days is going to uh, cause damage to your health. Right. Um, and, and that's, I think, if someone was going to try it, so I think that's one thing that we haven't talked about yet. Like, let's talk about some some um, some expectations, right? Especially since you're just getting started. In yeah. Um, had I not committed and said, I'm going to do this for the month of November, um, days one and two, I felt great. Yep, me too. Uh, instantly felt great. But then day three, I started feeling like dog poop. Mm -hmm. Day three through, I told you about eight, is what they call the carnivore flu. Okay. It's real. Okay. And it sucks. Now, I don't know why, because you're not switching pathways. Your body's still going to be running off glycogen. Yeah, so I think, I, I think part of that is um, it's just getting used to um, nothing but meat. It's getting used to no fiber. It's getting used to... Um, you know, more protein because, you know, like for me, I have been in ketosis. So, um, having that high of protein intake, I was no longer in ketosis. Right. So it's like, okay, now how do we switch into, you know, burning fat, but not being in ketosis. So it's almost like being, it's almost like keto flu, right? right? Like you don't, have that's carbs. what it feels like. Yeah. Like you don't have carbs coming in and you're not really burning ketones yet. Right. So your body's searching for fuel and, you can burn fat without being in ketosis, but it's just not as pleasurable. Yeah, right. And that's why it's called the keto flu. Right. Um, so day three through seven, three through eight was brutal. Now, I was traveling during that stretch. This is probably the most difficult diet for, for travel. Uh, we talked about this, and I think the second trip that I took – uh, I actually took a George Foreman grill with me. Right. And I'm grilling meat in the hotel room. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think having committed and having said on social media I'm doing this yeah, is, yeah. is probably the biggest thing that kept me going through that stretch. Um, so I think if anybody's going to try to do it, just realize, like, there is an adaptation period. Uh, it's usually, like, day three through eight. Maybe day nine, ten, eleven, I started feeling um, a, a little bit better each day. After about two weeks, I think the, the words that were used in, in an explanation to me by someone who had been through it previously were uh, for the system to come online. Mm -hmm. And I think that is such an appropriate way to describe it because, you know, it's it's the mental stuff. It's the digestive stuff. Um, expect some bowel movements that aren't fun. Yeah. Um, disaster right. pants, you know, too much MCT or butter in your coffee. Like that's right. kind of what it is, um, you know, every once in a while in that stretch. Um, and once the system comes online, all that, the keto flu, the bowel movements, it all kind of regulates. And then the interesting thing for me was from, from that point on every single day was like, man, I just kept feeling, feeling better and better. And, um, like I said, I was getting stronger. Um, I mean, if I look at myself, I feel like I'm more muscular now than I was six weeks ago. And that's kind of crazy to me. 
I mean, it does make sense. So more protein, less carbs. Like it, it does make sense. For yeah, and I mean, if, if you want to build new tissue, it makes sense to eat animal tissue and let your body assimilate that into new tissue. I mean, we are for sure. like, I mean, literally, we are made up of the raw materials that our body is provided by what we eat. So, I mean, it does make sense. Something I think people overlook is the fact that we're so opportunistic in our evolution that we're highly adaptable. Yeah. And so, fuck yeah, you can do a vegetarian diet. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you can do a carnivore diet. Like, your body is going to figure out a way to keep living, right? And yeah. as, like, us who are trying to, like, kind of figure out what's that, wh where it's going to allow us to kind of maximize our potential is, like, we kind of find ourselves experimenting with these different areas. Yeah. But that's something to remember. It's like, you're, I guarantee you're going to wake up tomorrow, right? Like, your body is going to figure out a way to digest this food that you're eating and it's going to continue to move forward. Um, and, and that's a really good point because it brings up the question of, okay, in 30 days I didn't get scurvy or jaundice or, right. or whatever, but does that mean it's sustainable? Does that mean that this is optimal? Does that mean that this is healthy long-term? I don't know. I, yeah. I'm not going to say that it is because I don't know. I can tell you that there are people who have been eating this way for 20 years. Those are the people that encourage me, are like most encouraging to me. The yeah. People that have been on it for 20 years. Yeah. And Baker talked about this on Joe Rogan, that there are some people, I have not seen pictures of these people, so I don't know, but he says that there's, you know, some people that are like 50, 60 years old that look like they're 30 or 40 because they've been eating this way, uh, you know, for 20 years. And I mean, maybe, um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm much more likely to believe or, or at least, give credence to something coming from someone who's been doing it for 20 years. Um, because I feel like if, if there was going to be some backlash from our body, uh, that, that they would have experienced it by now. Right. So I don't know. The, the other thing that's really encouraging to me is the fact that Sean Baker, the guy we keep kind of referring to, and if you guys haven't listened to the Joe Rogan podcast, definitely go listen to that. But he's a world record rower. Yeah, he's broken all of these records. He's a master's... Um, uh, world record holder and he's broken all these records after going carnivore yeah which is wild like that seems very carb demanding yeah but you know here's the thing I wasn't aware of this he talked about it on the Joe Rogan show that his background was like bodybuilding and then powerlifting and strongman so I mean he has a pretty incredible strength base yeah going into this when he's got type 2 muscle fibers Right. From a lifetime of it. Right. right. And, I mean, I don't know a lot of masters rowers who have that background. And you and I and most of your listeners know that, I mean, if you want to excel right. in, in any endeavor, that the stronger you are, the better your potential is to excel in those endeavors. Yep. So, I mean, here's a dude coming into an event that isn't normally frequented by people with a massive strength background. So, I mean, is he excelling because he's a carnivore or is he excelling because of his background? So I think the fact that he can do it as a carnivore is, I guess, what's yeah. encouraging me, right. you right. know, because it, it just generally you would think, okay, that's going to take carbs to go all out for about a minute and a half, right? Right. So one last thing I want to touch on, because this is what's really getting me right now is the fucking cost. I'm spending like 40 bucks a day, I think, on yeah. food, because so, to get like ribeye, yep. you know, we're talking basically 20 bucks for a meal. Yeah, so what I did, uh, I looked at that same thing going in, and I knew I wasn't going to eat ribeye twice a day, every day, uh, for a couple of reasons. I've really never been a huge fan of that cut of meat. Mm. Um, now, on the carnivore diet, I enjoyed it, um, but what I did was I looked at the breakdown of protein to fat in that particular cut, because that's sort of like the gold standard for what they're going for. Right. Um, and what I found was that it was a 1.4 to 1 ratio of protein to fat. Okay. And I started looking at other meats and, and looking for that ratio. What I found is that 85-15 ground beef was about the same. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that I ate an entire deer. Um, you know, all of my meat from my deer is going to be really lean. Yeah, it's a very lean. So what I did was I went online. I actually went to uh, Fatworks and I bought uh, buffalo tallow and wild boar lard. And when I ate leaner cuts of meat, I would add those animal fats to it. Um, 
and I just, you know, I, I, again, I, did, I didn't want to measure, so I would just, you know, take a few spoonfuls and throw it on. Um, the buffalo tallow I would cook with. The board lard was, you know, more viscous, so I could put that on after cooking. Yeah. Um, and basically what I tried to do was match those macros from a ribeye, but with other sources of meat. So, again, like wild salmon, um, you know, I was actually able to find that cheaper than ribeye. Um, and then of course having the deer was, I mean, that was really ridiculously cheap. Right. Um, so I don't, I know that's probably not an option for most people, but, um, well, I think I'm going to go buy an animal. That's what I've been thinking. I'm just going to buy yeah. like a good, like, I, I, I would highly animal. suggest that. And, and I think that's, that's probably the most cost effective way to eat, whether you're right. Anyway, carnivore or not, you know, yep. find a, she's find highlighted a right now that I'm like, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. When it's a hundred percent of your diet. Right. Um, the other thing that I did eat a lot of was bone marrow. Um, so like when I would have, you know, sometimes when I had those leaner cuts, whether it was salmon or, um, venison, I would have bone marrow and, uh, you know, that would give me more fats and then mm-hmm. I would actually make bone broth with the, the leftover bones. And I used that as a way to kind of safeguard against, um, you know, the, the downside of potential gut health issues, but also for more minerals. Um, so I think. Those are, those are approaches to making carnivore potentially more sustainable and more healthy that aren't talked about as often. You know, you can take any diet and you can make it more or less healthy. Like For there's sure. tons of people in the right. keto world who, you know, they're eating nothing but, you know, Velveeta cheese and, you know, shitty bacon. Right, right, right. And they're like, oh, it's only three net carbs and yeah, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. And the so, vegetarian, too, you can be way fucked up on that. Right. You can right. eat all carbs. So, I mean, the, the thing that no matter how I eat, I'm always focused on quality, food quality right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, covering those bases, you know, to the best of my ability through animal products right. on this particular experiment. So, um, so back to your original question about making it a little bit more cost effective. Uh, the other thing too is I love the idea of making yourself go to the grocery store every time you're ready to eat, but you're gonna quickly get tired of doing that. Yeah, it's not gonna be sustainable. Right. I did it now because I thought it was cool, and today day three where I'm feeling like shit, I'm like, yeah, I'm picking yeah. up beef on the way home. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I would suggest buying in bulk um, and, and cooking in bulk even too. Like, yeah, uh, there were a few times like with the deer, I, you know, I made a big roast and just had you know meat standing in the refrigerator. And, those were the best meals because it was just like, all right, here's this giant dish from the refrigerator and I'm just going to sit there and eat until I don't want to eat anymore. And then yeah, I just right. put it back and like, to me, that's the epitome of like primal carnivore because it's like, that's really how our ancestors would have eaten. Right. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. So there you go. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll update people. Um, I like that you've already finished your journey. Notice I waited for you to finish before I started. <laughs> well, and, and that's what I was going to say. It's like, I mean, what other questions about where where you are in your experience and like i mean i i would since i've been through it i'm happy to serve right as not i mean we talked about a lot of a lot of what's been coming up i mean today i'm in day three so today was rough i'll be honest um your next week will be the worst experience uh, worst period of this experience for you good because i'm riding my bike all night friday night perfect (laughs) um oh that's right you're traveling that's right i'm traveling Uh, straight to ride my bike all night all right that's gonna be a Brutal stretch. Uh, you know what I'm gonna do is cook bacon, because okay. bacon cures. You can it can yep. be warm. I'm gonna I'm gonna cook like three packs of bacon and bring it with me on the airplane. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. Smart. I yeah. like it. Yeah, that's what I've been thinking. Um, and the other thing I've been doing is I've been adding a ton of bone broth to make up for the electrolytes. Yeah. You know because um, I salted the hell out of everything I ate. Okay. Um, there you go. Yeah. Himalayan sea salt and like that. Yep. 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 Tons of salt. That's yeah, cool. so so the diet was basically meat, salt, and water. <laughs> <laughs> everything you would think you definitely should not do, right? And I got well, everything they say killed our parents early, right? Yeah, killed the generation before yeah. us early. And I lost body fat and got stronger. There you go. And my testosterone went up subjectively. Right, right. Yeah, I don't know. I think I, you know. I always tell people like, dude, if you know, even fats. Like, I I think people should try them because it gives you a tool in your toolbox, right? right. You you gain a little bit of a better understanding of how. You know how your body's going to process food, and maybe you you grab a tool that you can use later on. Who knows? So there you go. Be a steak eater. I'm excited to see how this whole revolution unfolds. I think it's going to blow up now that kind of Joe Rogan. Th- you know, yeah, I think so. So I was actually looking at uh, podcasts. 
for a different reason, but I noticed that Baker on the Rogan show was like the number two podcast the other day uh, in all podcast downloads. Oh, wow. I think that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I predict in 2018 that carnivore will kind of be what keto was in 2016. I think you're going to see it. You're, 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 we're, we're, we're not done hearing about carnivore. Right, right. Yeah, we're I probably going to be tired of hearing about it in six months. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think so too. Um, well, cool, man. Thanks for being on and uh, sharing your journey with us. That's my, cool. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E.com. Thanks for your support, and we will see you next time. Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland.